In the last lecture, we discussed an issue known as the Compromise of 1850. And I said at the time that uh, this was good in the sense that it prevented a civil war in 1850, which is probably a good thing. It's still very questionable as to whether or not America could have survived had that happened in 1850. But nobody was very happy with the Compromise of 1850. Um, you're going to see more of that here today. But generally speaking, I want to come back to this issue. The, the big question is where can slavery expand into? What parts of this new North American empire can it go into? And more importantly, who has the legal constitutional right to say? And what are the limits of those rights? So that being said, I want to I want to begin with a guy from Illinois. Um, if you're following along in the PowerPoint with me, um, that's Stephen Douglas right there, uh, described as the little giant. He was not very tall. He was under five foot four inches, uh, but he had these massive, massive ambitions, including to be president of the United States. And he didn't he didn't come too far away from it either. Stephen Douglas is not only a leading Democrat. In 1854, he's sort of being seen, he's, he's being looked at as a very good possibility of the Democratic nomination um, for the presidency, possibly even the presidency itself. And so you can understand how and why he might want to be making a splash in the world of politics. And Douglas was just convinced that there was still one more thing that we had not yet tried when it comes to settling this issue of slavery once and for all, and that was the West. In particular, he introduces this concept known as popular sovereignty. Now, let me tell you something. Popular sovereignty is not hard to understand. All it really means is voting. That's really all you mean, right? Let the people of the West, these territories that were organizing into states, let them decide the legality of slavery once and for all. I mean, after all, what's more small d democratic than the institution of voting? Douglas is going to introduce legislation into the Senate as a very high-powered senator from the state of Illinois. And the legislation is known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And what he's saying here is that Kansas and Nebraska will be organized through this institution of popular sovereignty. Um, this is politically advantageous to Douglas because what this does is it allows him to talk out of both sides of his mouth. He can tell both sides, just get your people into the right place and you can outvote the opposition. He can be pro-slavery and anti-slavery all at one time. So, here's the way that things end up going. Um, on the eve of the election, there were a lot of pro-slavery supporters that were camped just east of the uh, Kansas border with Missouri. Now, keep in mind, Missouri is a slave state. And when the, uh, when the election opened up, this great big huge conglomeration of pro-slavery supporters, they all poured across the Kansas border and they created what came to be known as the Lecompton government. Now for your notes, the Lecompton government legalized slavery and it said that, that Kansas would be forever a slave state. Now, to the north, there was a conglomeration of free staters. These are people that would eventually form what was called the Lawrence government, and they made slavery illegal in Kansas. And so what's going wrong is you've got two governments, both of whom are convinced of their victory, and, and, and both of whom are saying two very different things. Popular sovereignty didn't do very much at all when it comes to solving this age-old question. What was worse, from the Lecompton government's perspective, we think that over 60% of the votes that were cast were done so illegally. There is an enormous amount of corruption. I don't know if you're familiar with Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Certainly that law applied to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, especially when it came to Kansas. Um, this was a huge, huge failure. And it made Stephen Douglas look kind of stupid in the process. 
More importantly, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to destroy the Whig Party. Keep in mind, just like the Democratic Party, uh, the Whig Party was a national party, and the issue of slavery was a massive dividing wedge. And in 1854, they just never came back. And truth be told, it came very, very close to doing the exact same thing to the Democratic Party. Um, but back to the Whigs, it's going to be out of the ashes of the Whig Party that you're going to see the rise of the Republican Party, okay? 1854 forward, there are a couple different things that are going to converge to form the big R, Abraham Lincoln, Dwight Eisenhower, Republican Party. Um, one of those things would be the Free Soil Party. Many people that were Free Soilers um, found a new home in the Republican Party. And many of those people that believe deeply in the Whig philosophy of entrepreneurship and you get what you put into something and um, tacitly anti-slavery generally for the purposes of preserving opportunity for white people. But those leftover Whigs, and Abraham Lincoln's going to be one of them, those leftover Whigs are going to form another core constituency within the Republican Party. But before we go on any further, I want you to understand that the central platform, its whole reason for being, the Republican Party, is no expansion of slavery into the West. You can have it in Georgia. You can have it in South Carolina. It just cannot move into the Western territories. That is going to be the reason for being for the Republican Party. And in a way, guys, the Republican Party is really going to be the vehicle for anti-slavery. People like Lincoln understand if slavery cannot expand, it'll die a natural death anyway. As a matter of fact, that's what was happening to it in Virginia and in Maryland. It was the Cotton Revolution that breathed new life back into it, as we found out over the course of this semester. But one thing that um, I want to go back to is just this colossal failure that, that would be the Kansas-Nebraska Act. There's a lot of violence that ends up emerging from these failures. Couple points here. Um, the, the creation of the Lawrence government that said slavery would be illegal. Um, this enraged the Lecompton government and the sheriff of Lecompton um, ordered a posse to be formed, uh, go up to Lawrence, arrest their leaders, bring them back down to Lecompton so that they can stand trial. Well, the, the, the posse quickly degenerated into a mob which burned down much of Lawrence, Kansas, and we think that five people uh, of the anti-slavery variety were killed in this melee. Uh, back in the East, a newspaper man, a guy by the name of Horace Greeley, uh, dubbed the term Bleeding Kansas. And uh, for your notes, all you need to understand about that is it's this little miniature civil war that's raging on the plains of Kansas. You've got people that are literally killing each other. Um, the, the other thing that's probably important for you to understand um, is that there's, there's, there's abolitionists in Kansas as well. One of those abolitionists that I'd like you to be mindful of would be a guy from Massachusetts by the name of John Brown. Um, John Brown uh, was, was a man of a checkered past, but the one thing that he hated was the institution of slavery. And he had estimated that at least five people lost their lives of the anti-slavery variety. So he and his own posse uh, disguised themselves as Bible salesmen, and they, uh, they assassinated five more pro-slavery supporters. And so, again, another good example of bleeding Kansas. Um, th this was a dismal, dismal failure. And Stephen Douglas himself ultimately had to acknowledge it, especially the corruption, how many people were voting twice or made up aliases, you know, voting at all. And ultimately, they had to do the whole thing over again. Um, but what I want to do right now is, is get you to understand that, that there's an enormous amount of diversity in the Republican Party. Um, you've got your moderates, and those are your people that, that want to leave slavery alone where it presently exists. Um, certainly Lincoln falls into that category. The guys that you're looking at on the screen with me, those are your radical Republicans. The man on the right... Um, that is Thaddeus Stevens. He's the leader of the Radical Caucus in the House of Representatives. 
His colleague to his left is um, a radical Republican from Massachusetts. He is a leader in the Senate, the radical leadership in the Senate. That's Charles Sumner. I want to tell you a quick story about Charles Sumner that does relate to Bleeding Kansas. Um, the radical Republicans, they were really your abolitionists that had made their way to politics by the 1850s. And what made them radical was not necessarily that they wanted to abolish slavery everywhere, although they did. I mean, keep in mind, we're not talking about just limiting where it can go. They, they want to take it down in places like Georgia where it presently exists. What made them radical is they wanted to elevate the, the social and political status of newly freed African Americans with those of all citizens, irregardless of race. It was the social, political, and even cultural elevation that made the radical Republicans, in fact, radical. And certainly we'll continue to talk about these guys both during and after the Civil War. But for right now, going back to Charles Sumner, there are certain things that are understood about your behavior and your, you know, the, 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 the things that you do, the actions that you take in the Senate. There, there are things that you, you know, know that you're not supposed to do. And one of those things is name names, right? You can stand up in front of the Senate and you can wail away against slavery and damn it here and blast it there and you get the idea. But you're not supposed to name names. And that's exactly what Charles Sumner does in 1854 right after, you know, this disaster, this debacle of Kansas. He is blasting slavery and, and he's actually calling southern senators out by name um, that, that they're very terrible people for the institutions uh, that they continue to practice. One of those individuals is a guy from South Carolina by the name of Andrew Butler. Butler's a relatively old man when Charles Sumner not only calls him out but just goes up one side and right back down the other. Just a verbal tongue lashing. Um, the problem is that he's old and relatively feeble, and he can't really do much more than just sit back and take it. But he is absolutely furious. He's got a nephew that's actually a congressman from South Carolina, a guy by the name of Preston Brooks. And the following day, um, Preston Brooks went to go visit his uncle in his senatorial office. And, and very clearly, there's, there's something wrong with Butler. Um, and, and Brooks asks him what's going on. And, and when, when Butler explained what happened and how embarrassing it was and there wasn't anything he could do and all of the colleagues were looking on, Preston Brooks was, was probably even more furious than his uncle. So um, the next day, uh, well, the Senate is in session. Um, Brooks walks in to the Senate. Now, nobody thought very much of that considering he's a congressman. Maybe he had business there. They didn't think anything of that. Brooks walked with a cane. You might be able to tell where this one's headed. He walked up to Charles Sumner. Now, I'm paraphrasing him, of course, but he said, Sir, you've insulted my state, you've insulted my family, and you've insulted my heritage. And then he cracked him over the head with his cane. He beat him again and again and again to the point where Charles Sumner eventually went unconscious. Um, suffered permanent brain damage. It was a savage, savage beating. We're not talking about in the plains of Kansas. This is not the Wild West. This was this was Washington, D.C. So bleeding Kansas had come back east to Washington. It got so bad that there, there's such heated debate when it comes to this whole issue of slavery that it was said that that peep, the only the only congressmen that were not coming to Congress armed with a gun were coming with two guns and a knife. So th this is where we've sunk when it comes to political discord in, in American life by the 1850s. And it's in this context, guys, that we get maybe one of the worst presidents, arguably the worst president in American history. James Buchanan is going to be a Democrat from Pennsylvania. And although he's a northern Democrat, he's got clear interest in, in, in the institution of slavery. That's not necessarily what makes him a failure. He's not going to do very much in the way of encouraging compromise. Uh, we're not talking about Henry Clay here. Now, to be entirely fair to Buchanan, 
um, we're really approaching this point where we're, we're, we're no longer able to compromise our way out of these things. But Buchanan is ultimately going to, um, he, he's going to come up short on the Supreme Court decision, uh, which might sound a little bit strange right now, but just stay with me. He's not really going to take this opportunity to kind of settle that whole issue. Um, certainly this is not going to be the last time that we talk about Buchanan. We'll, we'll pick him up a little bit more in the next lecture. But for right now, um, I want to get to Dred Scott. Now, Dred Scott is a slave that was born and raised in Missouri. And his owner takes him to Illinois, right across the border. And that's a free state. There were many people in Illinois that convinced Dred Scott that he, since he was in Illinois, and Illinois was a free state, to sue his owner for his freedom. He does, and he wins. It goes all the way to the state Supreme Court, which, which upholds the lower court's decision. Dred Scott, you are a free man. There's one more card for his owner to play, and that would be the card of the Supreme Court. In 1857, the, the Dred Scott case arrives at the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is a man from Maryland, a slave owner in his own right, a guy by the name of Roger B. Taney. And the ruling that comes out that, that's succinctly known as Dred Scott, or the Dred Scott decision, um, it proclaims two things. Ready? One, it says that slaves are property, legally defined they are property, and therefore Dred Scott never should have made it into a court in Illinois, in Washington, D.C., and anywhere, right? Property cannot sue citizens, and therefore those those earlier rulings from the lower courts, they they were moot. They were null and void. They never should have happened. The other thing that the Supreme Court says is is a lot more important, right? The other thing that it says is because that slaves are property, they could be taken anywhere in the country. They could be taken to Illinois, they could be taken to South Carolina, they could be taken to Massachusetts, and they could certainly be taken into the territories, into Kansas, into Nebraska, into Nevada, into anywhere that their owners pleased. They were legally speaking property. This was an enormous defeat for the abolition movement. It was a huge win for the South because theoretically, and certainly Abraham Lincoln picked up on this point, theoretically slaves could be taken anywhere, anywhere in the country. That's what the highest court just said. Now, <clears throat> I have made mention of this in the past. We've talked about this with Thomas Jefferson. We've talked about this with Andrew Jackson. Simply because the high court says one thing or another does not mean that you have to strictly enforce that law. You saw Andrew Jackson simply ignore the Wooster versus Georgia decision, and which led to the Trail of Tears. Um, James Buchanan doesn't have to go out there and enforce the Dred Scott decision. He does. That means that this whole issue of slavery, it's not going to get resolved anytime soon. You still have these big question marks in terms of where to go and what, what's up next. The other thing that I want to kind of press upon you is this whole issue of the Republican Party. Keep in mind, their whole platform is no expansion of slavery. The Supreme Court just issued a ruling that said that there was nothing you could do legally-wise, constitutional-wise, that could prevent slave owners from taking their property into the territories. So in theory, the Republican Party is an illegal political organization. If that's your reason for being, that makes you an illegal political organization. So it's a decision that the Republican Party simply cannot accept the legitimacy of. And it's out of this context that we get one of the most important, arguably the most important person in all of 1301, and that would be Abraham Lincoln. A little bit about Abraham Lincoln, simply because he does dovetail nicely with the entirety of this course. Lincoln's father was a hand-to-mouth Yemen father, father um, that, uh, that, that, that farmed for a living. And they grew up in... Kentucky, which even by the standards of back then was the wilderness, 
Um, Lincoln didn't exactly know what he wanted to do, but he was pretty sure he didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps, did not really want to be a farmer. Um, ultimately, he settled upon the law. He became a very good lawyer, tried many cases. He didn't go to law school at Illinois. He definitely didn't go to a place like Harvard. He was self-taught. He read books until his eyeballs fell out, and he joined the Illinois State Debate Society. By this point in time, Lincoln had moved to the state of Illinois. And if you think about it, that's what lawyers do. They debate each other. Lincoln believed, generally speaking, in something called equality. Maybe more specifically, the equality of opportunity. And he felt that what slavery did to the equality of opportunity was simply blasphemy. That what the Founding Fathers had intended was a meritocracy in the sense that you get out of life what you put into it. If you work hard, you'll have material success. You'll, you'll, you'll have professional success. You get out what you put in. And to him, slavery just turned that whole idea entirely on its head. By the 1850s, Lincoln had entered politics. And 1858, he had went out and challenged Mr. Democrat, Stephen Douglas, for his seat in the U.S. Senate from the state of Illinois. L let me make sure you understand this. I know you know who Lincoln is, but in 1858, nobody knew who he was. Everybody knew the name Stephen Douglas. Um, what you do in that situation is you challenge your opponent to a debate. You get him out there in the public and you try to catch him in a trap. You, tr you try to trip him up a little bit. And that's exactly what Abraham Lincoln would do throughout 1858. And these debates became very, very famous. Uh, they come to be known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And they're really going to put Lincoln on the map uh, nationally from a political standpoint. But generally speaking, what, 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 what Douglas would do is play right into the hands of Abraham Lincoln by saying that what Lincoln was all about, what the Republicans were all about, was elevating slaves to the equality of white people. And Lincoln said, I never have, and I certainly haven't throughout the course of this campaign, but when it comes to eating the, own, the bread that his own hand helped to produce, of course the slave is my equal, and he's your equal, and he's the equal to any man. In other words, hard work, you should get out of that what you put in. And that was the great, great tragedy of slavery. Now, in 1860, Lincoln is going to become a dark horse to run for the presidency. To be sure, he lost that election with Stephen Douglas. Um, Douglas was simply too much, but but those debates really got people talking. People in places like New York, people in places like Ohio. And back in those days, you didn't really fully know who was going to be the actual nominee, really until the, the, the day that they were, they were holding the nominating ceremonies. And the night before um, the nominating ceremonies in the Republican National Convention of 1860, the powers that be within the party said, you know what, he is just so much more electable than the guy that had been the leading candidate, a guy from New York by the name of William Sewell. Um, he's from the Midwest. Uh, Illinois touches states like um, Iowa. It touches states like Missouri. It touches states like Indiana. Um, as a Midwesterner, he's got a lot more appeal than New Yorkers might. Furthermore, Lincoln's a moderate. Sewell's not a moderate. There's just so much more that's more probable when it comes to electing him as opposed to this other guy. So at the very last minute, Lincoln's name goes up. He gets the nomination. Um, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. Lincoln's going to go on to win the nomination. Excuse me, he's going to go on to win the presidency. The Republican Party is a really important part of all of this primarily because they have figured it out at that point. If Lincoln is able to take every northern state in the country, he will win the election. He doesn't even have to be on the, the ballot in the South, and in many cases he's not. So anyway, Lincoln carries every state in the, in the North, with the exception of New Jersey, and what he lacked in New Jersey made up for in California and Oregon. So Lincoln is elected president without one Southern vote. 
That's, that's very, very important. Without one Southern vote, that means that the South is rendered essentially irrelevant, right? Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter if you don't even put the guy on the ballot, they can beat you now, and there's nothing that you can do about it. What does Lincoln's election have to do with the guy that you're looking at on the screen there, a guy that we've talked about, John Brown? Well, here's what it has to do. Later on that year, John Brown is going to raid a federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Now, an arsenal, arsenal is where they make guns, ammunition, cannon, that sort of thing. Um, today, it would be equivalent of uh, a group of terrorists taking over a nuclear power plant. I mean, it's that magnitude of seriousness. Eventually, John Brown is um, arrested. They, they, they catch him. They, they put him under siege. They catch him, put him on trial for treason, and eventually he's executed. Now, I don't know that the, that the South really expected a full-throated apology for John Brown from the North, but they probably did expect Northerners to say, listen, he doesn't represent us. I know we've got our differences, but certainly he does not reflect our attitude toward you in that capacity. That didn't happen. Not only did they not say that, in a lot of ways, in poetry, in music, in folklore, John Brown became a hero, a martyr for the cause. And what this is going to convince states like South Carolina of is maybe Lincoln doesn't talk that game publicly. Maybe he doesn't kind of exude any of these symptoms that John Brown had. But believe me, Every northerner, politician or otherwise, is capable of doing something like this. In short, if Lincoln is elected, our very way of southern life is going to be under attack, right? He might not say it, but covertly he's going to do it. And even if he doesn't do it, keep in mind, we just lost the presidency without one single solitary southern vote. If not Lincoln, then it's only a matter of time before another northern president comes along and abolishes the institution of slavery. So, with all of this taken together, John Brown's raid, the North's reaction, as well as Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860, the South feels it has no other alternative but to secede. We'll pick it up there the next time we meet.